Oh, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm grateful to the Greenwich Village Historical Preservation Society, that's a good mouthful, and also the New York Public Library for having me, and David Carpenter. The Age of Innocence is based on a 1920 novel by Edith Wharton, and this was the subject of my dissertation in my doctoral musical arts degree at the Boyer College of Music at Temple University in Philadelphia. So today I want to talk to you about how I adapted this novel into an opera, and how the city of New York figures as an important element both in the novel and in the opera. Can I get a show of hands of how many people have read or know the story of the Age of Innocence? All right, wonderful. I think there's no fans here. But I'll give you um, just a little refresher, perhaps uh, also for those of you who are not, are not familiar with the story. So it takes place in New York High Society of the 1870s. Newland Archer is a successful young lawyer, and he is engaged to the lovely but conventional social rights of Mary Robert, and their marriage would unite two of New York's most respected families. Into this picture comes the Countess Ellen Walenska. This is May's cousin. She was born in the United States, but she moved to Europe, where she married the Polish Count Walensky, and he turned out to be a scoundrel, and she has left him abandoned her husband, and has returned to the United States. And because she has left her husband, New York society is very suspicious of her, She's returning in this aura of scandal. Now, Archer is trying to persuade May to advance the date of their wedding. He wants to get married as soon as possible. But it's New York tradition to have a rather long engagement. And she's res resisting any of this. At the same time, he's finding himself attracted to this unconventional woman who questions New York society and its social mores. But when Ellen announces her intention to seek a divorce from the Archer's family prevails upon him to dissuade her from this. This would constitute a social nightmare for, her, for the um, Archer's family and for May's family, since divorce was not approved of. It was legal in the United States and New York State at that time, but it was not approved of at all. And he does convince him to drop the divorce case. But by this time, Archer and Ellen have fallen in love with each other. And also, Archie gets the news that May has actually convinced her mother and Archer's mother to advance the date of the wedding. And he has to follow society's conventions, and he does marry May. So the rest of the story deals with the consequences of this love triangle. Archer dealing with the love of two women, one he wants badly, the other one he's married to, and it's uh, one of the greatest love stories I know. So I'd like to give you a little background now about these circumstances surrounding the composition of the novel. What you see on the screen here is an image of Edith Wharton in 1921. This is just after she had finished writing the novel. It was written between 1919 and 1920, and it was in the aftermath of the First World War. And Wharton was living in France at the time, and she witnessed a lot of the devastation, and she was instrumental in setting up a relief for the thousands of refugees who were coming into France at that time. And as she wrote in her memoir, A Backward Glance, if anyone had suggested to me before 1914 to write my reminiscences, I should have answered that my life had been too uneventful to be worth recording, not until the successive upheavals which culminated in the catastrophe of 1914 had cut all likeness from the name of my old New York, did I begin to see its pathetic picturesqueness. So in the age of innocence, work was attempting to resurrect this old New York, New York for youth in the 1870s. And indeed, old New York was the working title for the novel. As the word biographer R. W. B. Lewis put it, looking across the vast abyss of the war, Gordon located the lost America in the New York of her girlhood, the world in which she had passed her adolescence and first years of her womanhood, a safe, narrow, intellectual, and high down world, but from the tremendous distance of time and history, endearing and honorable. So what is this old New York that Wharton speaks of and loves so much? We should remember that she herself experienced this time period. She was born in 1862 near Parents Brownstone at 14 West 23rd Street, just off of Madison Square. But about four years later, because of the Civil War, and it was so expensive to live in New York at that time, the family fortunes has decreased. They moved to Europe for a, a number of years because it was more economical to live there. 
And then they returned to New York in 1872. And this was Edith's impression of it, as she recalled again at a Battery glance, 61 years later. She wrote, One of the most depressing impressions of my childhood is my recollection of the intolerable ugliness of New York, of its untended streets and the narrow houses so lacking in external dignity, so crammed with smug and suffocating apostrophe. How could I understand that people who had seen Rome and Seville and Paris and London could come back to live contentedly between Washington Square and the Central Park? And here is an image of Washington Square in Greenwich Village, where Warden and her mother lived for a time in 1882. But she goes on to recognize that there was something of value to the New York of her childhood. She wrote, what I could not guess was that this little ghost of the rectangular of New York, cursed with its universal chocolate-colored coating of the most hideous stone in her quarry, <laughs> this cramped horizontal gridiron of a town without any towers, porticos, fountains, or perspectives, high-bound in its deadly uniformity of mean ugliness, would fifty years later be as much a banished city as Atlantis, or that the social organization which that prosaic setting had slowly secreted would have been swept to oblivion with the rest. One of these intolerable brownstones is there. <laughs> this is the home that Edith and her husband, Teddy Warden, lived in at 882 Park Avenue in the 1890s. So I'd like to look at the map of Manhattan now and show you some of the places that figure in the novel, actual places that uh, appear in the novel. <coughs> so the novel begins at the old Academy of Music, and this was at 14th Street and Irving Place, where the Red Hour is. So it's just on the northeast border of the village. And this is what it looked like. So Warden writes, in the age of innocence, these are the first lines of the book, on the January evening of the early 70s, Christine Nelson was singing in Faust at the Academy of Music in New York. Though there was already talk of the erection in remote metropolitan distances above the 40s of a new opera house, which should compete in costliness and splendor with those of the great European capitals, the world of fashion was still content to reassemble every winter in the shabby red and gold boxes of the sociable old academy. Conservatives cherished for being small and inconvenient, and thus keeping out the new people whom New York was beginning to dread and yet be drawn to and the sentimental clung to it for its historic associations, and the, music, and the musical for its excellent acoustics, always so problematic, and a quality in halls built for the hearing of music. And so here you have where the, the location of the old Metropolitan Opera House, that was the one that was torn down in the 1960s at 39th Street and Broadway. And that is an image of it in 1905. So even in the first senses of the novel, Morton is using the social setting the social stage of the story. There's this conservative element in New York that wants to keep out these new people, the new Borish, not connected to any of New York's old Dutch ancestors. And Elma Lenska herself, because of her European connections, will in fact turn out to be one of these people that New York wants to exile. Another locale was Delmonico's, which those us today, of course, a fashionable New York restaurant founded in 1831 by Lorenzo Delmonico. And coming out parties for young ladies were held there. And in the 1870s, it was located, as you see on the map, at Broadway and 26th Street. And the restaurant moved a number of times, but this was its location from 1861 to 76. Oh, I'm sorry, this location is actually 14th Street and 5th Avenue. The address I mentioned before is where it first was. And this is what it looked like at its location at 14th Street and 5th Avenue. And in the early part of the novel, the banker and notorious colonizer Julius Beaufort, he's one of the new people that New York society is afraid of, he invites Emma Maletska to an oyster supper at Delmonico's, where he plans to introduce her to a number of artists. She says, ah, oh, that does tempt me, except the other evening at Mrs. Struthers, I've not met a single artist since I've been here. And Archer, who's also in the room, and who does not approve of them associating with a man like Beaufort, he offers to introduce her to some art, to some uh, painters. And Beaufort replies with incredulity, painters? Are there painters in New York? <laughs> so, although Delmonico was itself a respectable place of old New York, artists at the time were viewed as sort of outcasts, wherein, as in Europe, 
where having spent so much of her life, art and artists were welcomed and valued. And Archer reflects on these cultural differences between Europe and America. Morton writes, he knew that there were societies where painters and poets and novelists and men of science and even great actors were sought after as dukes. He'd often pictured to himself what it would have been to live in the intimacy of drawing rooms dominated by the talk of Mary May, Thackeray, Browning, or William Morris. But such things were inconceivable in New York and unsettling to think of. He remembered with what amusement she had told him that her grandmother Mingott had and the Wellens objected to Ellen living in a bohemian quarter given over to people who wrote. And of course, Ellen was one of them. Um, Morton was one of those people who wrote. And yet, one of the reasons Archer is attracted to Ellen is for her very nonconformity, her ability to see through New York's hypocrisy and its obsession with what is fashionable. And he's also intrigued by Ellen's aesthetic sense. And like Ellen, he has a love for paintings and books and music. And this is made clear the very first time he visits Ellen at his house, and he notices the interior decoration, and this is what the work writes. The atmosphere of the room was so different from any he had ever breathed that self-consciousness vanished in the sense of adventure. What struck him was the way in which the house had, by a turn of hand, and the skillful use of a few properties and transformed into something intimate, foreign, subtly suggestive of old romantic scenes and sentiments. He tried to analyze the trick, to find a clue to it in the way that chairs and tables were grouped, and the fact that only two Jacquino roses, of which nobody ever bought less than a dozen, had been placed in the slender vase at his elbow, and in the vague, pervading perfume that was not what one put on handkerchiefs, but rather like the scent of some far-off bazaar, a smell made up of Turkish coffee, and they owned that we and dried roses. So after he sees Ellen for this first time at her, uh, at her house, he's in her house, he's on the street, he notice, notices a uh, flower shop, notices some yellow flowers there, yellow roses, and he has them sent to her, but he deliberately does not include his card, so he didn't make it clear that they were from him. And this growing attraction between Archer and Ellen is made apparent a few chapters later. This scene takes place at Wallach's Theater, which was on 844 Broadway. And this is what Wallach's Theater looked like in the year 1900. It's a star theater. It was, it was renamed the Star Theater. So later on in this uh, chapter, both Ellen and Archer are separately attending a performance of the play, The Chakra, a melodrama by the Irish playwright Dion Musico, who lived from 1820 to 1890. And Wharton writes this about the performance. There was one episode in particular that held the little house from floor to ceiling. It was that in which Harry Montague, after a sad, almost monosyllabic scene of parting with Miss Dias, those were the name of the actors, bade her goodbye and turned to go. The actress was standing near the mantelpiece, and looking down into the fire wore a gray cashmere dress without fashionable loopings or trimmings molded to her tall figure and flowing in long lines about her feet. Around her neck was a narrow black velvet ribbon with the ends falling down her back. When her wooer turned from her, she rested her arms on the mantel shelf and bowed her face in her hands. On the threshold, he paused to look at her, and then he stole back, lifted one of the ends of the velvet ribbon, kissed it, and left the room without hearing him or changing her attitude. And on this silent parting, the curtain fell. This is that ribbon kissing scene. Those are the actual two actors that uh, Warden talks about. So after this scene, during the intermission, Archer makes his way to the box where Helen is sitting with uh, some other members of New York society. And referring to the scene that the two of them have just witnessed, Helen says to him, do you think he will send her a bunch of yellow roses tomorrow morning. <laughs> Archer reddened and his heart gave a leap of surprise. He had called only twice on Madame Olenska, and each time he had sent her a box of yellow roses, and each time without a card. She had never before made any allusion to the flowers, and he supposed she had never thought of him as the sender. Now her sudden recognition of the gift, and her associating it with the tender leave taking on stage, filled him with an agitated pleasure. But Archer's dilemma is, of course, such that he cannot bring himself 
to give up marrying men. He's afraid of this because his, his whole society expects him to do this. Even though there is one scene, and this will be a scene I'll play from my opera, where she says to him, I think you love someone else. She doesn't suspect this person is Ellen, but he gives her, she gives him the chance to give her up. But he refuses it, and he does marry her. And their wedding takes place at Grace Church, which of course still stands today at 802 Broadway. And that's an image of the church. Uh, the church in 1875. But even at this, this scene of his wedding to May, with all of New York society watching it, this is the public witnessing of these two families being joined together. Everyone knows what's happening here, and they know that once you're married, you're going to remain faithful to this woman because we're all watching you at this point. But even in this scene, uh, while Archer is standing at the altar, his mind wanders. Warden writes, The ring was on May's hand. The bishop's benediction had been given. The bridesmaids were poised to resume their place in the procession, and the organ was showing preliminary symptoms of breaking out into the Mendelssohn March, without which no newly wedded couple had ever emerged upon New York. Your arm, I say, give her your arm, the best man nervously hissed. And once more, Archer was becoming aware of having been adrift far off from the unknown. What was it that had been sent him there, you wonder? Perhaps the glimpse among the anonymous spectators in the transept of a dark coil of hair under a hat, which a moment later revealed itself as belonging to an unknown lady with a long nose, so laughably unlike the person whose image he had evoked, they, and he asked himself if he were becoming subject to hallucinations. So it's a remarkable passage. Archer is literally in the presence of New York society, and Mary May is affirming what New York society stands for, but of course his thoughts are still on Ellen Malenska. So it's this juxtaposition of, of uh, claiming fidelity and also having the most seditious thought you could possibly have. He's thinking of another woman. So I'd like to talk now about how this relates to my opera. And I had the audacity to take Orton's great a novel and change it into an opera. And I, uh, well, I did my best to see what you think. When I was composing the opera, and I wrote both the music and the libretto, one of the challenges I was facing was how to take these two themes out that I mentioned about Ella's status as an outsider and the aesthetic sense that she and Archer share and make them understood by an audience. Now with opera, you only have so much time. With the novel, of course, you can put it down, go have a coffee, come back and read it and whatever. With opera, you have a few hours at most. Unless you're Wagner, and that's a whole other story. <laughs> But uh, what you have to do is, uh, when you're putting together the libretto, is be kind of vicious with the novel or with the subject. You have to condense things and still remain true to your subject, and this is what I tried to do. So I was figuring, how could I make this bond between Ellen and Archer uh, obvious in as, in as little time as possible? And I think I found the answer by, in the novel. There's a um, passage in which uh, Archer receives a uh, shipment of books from London. And it reads, that evening, Archer unpacked his books from London. Among them, he lit on a small volume of verse which he had ordered because the name had attracted him, the House of Life. He took it up and found himself plunged in an atmosphere unlike any he had ever breathed in books. So warm, so rich, and yet so ineffably tender that he gave a new and haunting beauty to the most elementary of human passions. All through the night, he pursued through those enchanted pages the vision of a woman who had the face of Ellen Olenska. So I figured there must be something to this book, uh, and it's a book of poems by Dante Gabriel Rossetti that had attracted Gordon. And I thought it would be interesting if a poem or two were part of the opera, part of the libretto. And so I did find one, and, uh, actually two poems that I said, and I also used this as a plot device. When Archer first visits Ellen's house, uh, I have her have this book on her table, The House of Life, and, and uh, she talks about the book. She says, when I was living in Europe and my husband was unfaithful and I was very unhappy, I read this book to find comfort. Now obviously this doesn't appear in the novel, but this is something I thought could work anyway. And before he leaves, she says, I would like you to have this book. And he accepts it. The next scene, 
Archer and May are going for a stroll. This is before they're married in Central Park. He has the book with him. And May says, oh, you have a book of poetry with you. Um, Yes, and so where did you get it? And he says, it came with my monthly shipment of books from London, but he had stopped himself. He's speaking about to say, Madame Valence, and he stops himself. So he's lying to her, so that's another thing I added in there. And he, the two of them sing one poem together as a duet, and then another poem he sings alone. And the poem is called Love's Testament. And the more he sings it, the more he's getting involved in the poem, and quite forgetting about me. So we'll listen to this. But before we do, I want to point out a particular point in the music. And this is the chord I wrote. You know, a chord is just simply a collection of musical tones, tones that sound together at the same time. And I call it the element. And it sounds like this. So you can see it has kind of an eerie, unsettled sound to it. And that is supposed to portray Ellen's status as an outsider. So I'll play the aria now, and you'll see on the screen when we get to that Ellen chord, you'll see underneath there Ellen chord. And this is the uh, aria of Love's Testament, and you'll see the words on the screen as well. And the tenor who we're seeing, a graduate student at Temple University, is Michael Leanhart, and the pianist is Donna Gill. And this is Love's Testament. <laughs>
It's been known uh, in Renaissance times and earlier as the devil in music. It's a very unsettled sound. And so what I was trying to do is be a little ironic there, that he's saying, thou art one with me, they're not going to be one. He's not going to have that. So the music contradicts his thoughts, contradicts the poem. So taking forward this idea, one of the tricks in opera is to make musical connections. If you're going to ask an audience to sit there for three hours, you better have something to say. And you want them to hear certain things and then bring them back. Now, this is hardly original with me. Many great composers have done it. And probably the most famous example is the leitmotif by Wagner, who will make a little tune and uh, associate with a certain character or a ring or any, uh, some sort of action. Or you might know Baba Wen in uh, when Avigny is first uh, she first uh, sees Rodolfo. She sings. <laughs> just saying, my name is Mimi, and it's quite lovely. And then, of course, in the last act when she's dying, she sings the same thing, and you, you melt, of course. So what I wanted to do in, in The Age of Innocence was take some of the melodies and harmonies you just heard in that aria and bring them back so that there's something underlying the emotion of what they said. That's the one great thing, well, one of the many great things about this novel. So much of the emotion is on the set, it takes place in the narration, and I thought to myself, this is where music can take that place. We can talk about all these unsaid emotions in this, in this society. So we're going to hear now the last scene of the first act. So in the opera, this is the second time Archer visits Ellen at her house. And Archer has just come back from Florida, where he saw May. That's where her family is for the winter. And May had a very serious conversation with him. She was suspecting that he loved someone else, but he doesn't suspect this person's Helen. And Archer is terrified about this, and he says, no, I love only you, and I only want to marry you. So in this scene, Archer's relating this conversation to Helen. And you'll hear May's voice, but this is just an Archer's memory. He's the only one who actually hears this. And there's one more element I wanted to point out in this scene. I took a few notes from that Ellen chord, and I rearranged them to create a motive, which just means a small collection of notes. It sounds like this. Um, no, it didn't quite work, right? It's, that's how it should sound. And this I call the unpleasant motive. Okay? This is the word that Morton uses all the time in the novel. The New York society is terrified of things that are unpleasant, anything that's going to upset the society. And Ellen turns out to be the most upsetting thing of all, and that they're going to exile her. And you'll hear this in the scene when it appears, all the word, uh, the unpleasant motive comes out. And then also, I'll note on the screen where you'll hear melodies from Love's Testament. This is mostly the piano, by the way. And also, the Ellen Lahore will return again. So, uh, just to set up the scene, it begins with Archer entering Ellen's house and is received by Ellen's maid, Nastasia, who has a box of red roses sent to Ellen by Julius Beaufort, that womanizer. And Archer disapproves of Ellen being seen with Beaufort. He's terrified that she is going to become his mistress. And at the end of the scene, Ellen receives a telegram from May saying that her mother and Archer's mother have agreed to advance the date of the wedding. And this is something Archer wanted for months, but of course, now he doesn't want it. And the credits for this uh, uh, scene, um, Archer again is Michael Leinhardt, Ellen is played by Peggy Yu, May is Elizabeth B. Jackson, and Anastasia is Shelley Jackson. And um, the pianist again is Don Miguel. I'm sorry, that was Elizabeth B. Johnson, not Johnson. And so uh, this is the last scene of the first act from The Age of Innocence.
making a few comments about the relevance of the age of innocence in the novel that is to our time. It's, almost, it's been almost 100 years since this book was published in, 19, in 1920. And the era describes took place over 140 years ago. And indeed, when it first came out in 1920, Walter, uh, Wharton's friend Walter Berry told her, yes, it is good, but of course you and I are the only people who will ever read it. <laughs> we are the last people who can remember New York and Newport as they were then, and no one else will be interested. Yet we're still fascinated by this story. It remains a bestseller to this day, and I suggest that this has something to do with its timeless theme of love. In this case, supported love, which most people have experienced on some level or another. But to this story, Wooden added something very interesting. The characters of the love triangle, especially Archer, have to deal with moral choices. Archer really has to grow up in the story and become a real man and realize that he cannot have May and Ellen the same time. And both of these women sincerely love him, but he has to choose, and he has to be with the woman that he married. And this is why Ellen loves Archer, for his goodness. She had seen enough disloyalty and cruelty in her own life, and Archer's kindness to her, not treating her as an outcast, was something, a kind of love she had never known before. Yet for her to have Archer would be for her and Archer to betray May, and that is why she says, don't you see, I can't love you unless I give you up. So the story is in many ways a chronicle of Archer's maturation into a real man, someone who understands the depth of love. And then this, I feel, is what makes the story unique and enduring allows us to relate to it. And I hope in my opera I remained true to the spirit of the story and um, that I think ranks high among the great stories in all literature. And that's all I have to say. If anyone has any questions, <laughs>